everybody for joining us. We're going to go ahead and get started here with Lynn Floyd and Blake, Gra Blake Graham Henderson, excuse me, for Ask You Doc and Antora. They are going to take us through a wonderful live demo here today, and it'll be very exciting to watch them work. I do want to say thank you really quickly to uh, our captioning sponsor, Mobius, as well as the Evergreen Community Development Initiative, which is our platform sponsor this week. And the Consortium of Ohio Libraries has underwritten the pre-conferences specifically, so we greatly appreciate all of their support. I have put the link for our captioning there in the chat. And uh, I do see that it is being live captioned. So if you want to read along, go ahead and click on that link and we will be there. We're going to put all the questions that we have for Lynn and Blake into the chat, and then they will pause periodically or as they're going through and answer those questions, we'll make sure that they all get read out so that they are on the YouTube recording. So without any further ado, I will go ahead and stop sharing my screen here. And you guys go ahead and take it away. All right, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Make sure I get the right screen. <laughs> Yep. Um, first of all, if we're going to go through and do a brief overview of the documentation as it exists right now and do a little bit of history of the documentation. Um, start off, um, when it says the 3.6 documentation right here, this is anything 3.6 and above because this is where we moved the, the platform from just straight ASCII dot to Antora. Um, for most of you don't know, the documentation didn't exist before really the first Evergreen Conference back in 2009. In 2009, at that point, it was a really big growth year for Evergreen. Um, a lot of that was also the year of the first Evergreen Conference. And the documentation issues group was developed at that time to allow us in our first set of documentation, and we're going to go over here. The first published set of set, published set of documentation was 1.6. Um, and then we had the 2.0, 2.1. Now, in 1.6, around about then, um, we actually started writing the documentation in DocBook. A lot of us struggled with DocBook. There was too much involved with DocBook. So it was, the, the, actually the documentation, I think they've moved it off of, yeah. Um, if anybody still has that 1.6 documentation, um, <laughs> I don't think it exists anymore in, in any of the current servers. Um, Evergreen in Action um, was published in 2012. It was a combination of, of things that um, they put out, um, and it was based on 2.3. It was a Dan Scott, Kathy Lazor, Robert Solier, James Keenan, and Lindsay Stratton um, wrote this. Um, it's basically, it's the basic set setup for a guide to set up Evergreen um, from 2.3. A lot of that has changed and some of it hasn't. Uh, since then, we've slowly ever every year have published new for every version since then, we have published new documentation and the new database schemes slowly um, have also come. Uh, in 3.1 and 3.2, we started actually doing the individual modules, 3.3 individual modules. And then in 3.5, we um, was the last that was truly ASCII dot, and we moved in Tor in 3.6. Um, so, as of right now, your current documentation, which is 3.6, if you click on the HTML, it does take you to the Intor documentation site. Um, so, the only problem that we have with Intor is that it, it does not have a PDF version. So, like, 
Yeah, yeah, I'll take it from here. One thing we uh, kind of skipped over was, hi, I'm I'm Blake Graham Henderson. <laughs> I'm at uh, I, I work at Mobius and um, been in been a proud Evergreen uh, community member for you know since 2012 or so. Um, but some of the stuff that Lynn remembers about the documentation that she just kind of went over the history there, I don't re remember or wasn't a part of the 2009 and kind of the trials and tribulations of all of the documentation. So I think that we've really come a long way as a community in terms of the um, documentation. Um, yeah. and we, we have arrived here at this um, interface that Lynn is showing. And I just um, kind of wanted to go over some of the highlights of what we're getting out of this uh, documentation site. Um, First of all, that might be um, pretty prominent on your screen is the left hand side, we have the navigation. The navigation is on every single page on every documentation um, page that you might come to and it is divided by modules and sort of contiguous with what we had with 3.5. As Lynn was talking about having the things broken out into modules. So they're sort of broken out into modules here in the documentation page itself. So you don't need to go and choose a module and then just browse that module. You have access to all of them all the time here in the navigation. Um, and so what Lynn is showing off is also sort of a, a part of the navigation. You'll notice there are little triangles that indicate that there are sub navigations beneath. So if you click on it or click on serials, the whole word, it will drop down and give you each individual um, uh, piece of serials. And if you click a page, um, preferably a page that has more going on in it, then let's see. I'm going to get the um, show off uh, the table of contents on any page. Just pick, just go down through here until you find one that has a, a pretty decent table of contents. That one's only got two. There's one. Well, oh. well, that's one had pretty good. So you've got on any given page, you have the title header that mirrors or should mirror close to what the navigation says it is. And that is the uh, heading zero, the very, and there's only one heading zero per page. It's is that large text at the top, followed by the table of contents, which is automatically generated for us based on all of the subheadings below the page. So, um, and then sometimes, and, and this is a good example, there is a subheading, a sub, table of contents. So settings overview then has a sub subheading of data types. And that can go all the way down to four or I believe five levels, um, heading levels down five levels. So you could see as many as indented five times. And then uh, helpful on the right hand side, we have this thing called contents, which is the same thing as table of contents, except it floats. It's always floating there and telling you See how it highlights, it might be kind of small on your screen, but it does highlight the section of the documentation that you're viewing currently as you scroll down through the page. Some of you may already be familiar with this, but just giving you the overview of, of the documentation as it is today. Um, in addition to that, across the top of any page, like as you can see here, we are in the local administration library settings editor and the bread that's called the breadcrumb trail so the breadcrumb trail there is the root which is the document root slash module name slash page name and so it's another way of knowing where you are all the time furthermore on the left hand side you'll see the navigation is bolded on the page you are on and then we get a really neat feature which is version changing you we didn't specifically point it out on the previous page, but where all of the documentation is listed out starting at 1.6 and going up to 3.6, we have a, a version number. We have a version number saying 
3.4, click here, 3.5, click here. Well, now it's sort of integrated here. Starting in 3.6, it's integrated here. And you can switch between 3.6 and 3.7. I'm getting, um, Lynn, I think your microphone. Is there plates? Somebody's plates clanging around. My husband's anyway. doing Okay. So on um, 3.6, we were just looking at the 3.6 version of that document, and you can switch to 3.7 and see the same exact document, but the 3.7 version. Um, by and large, any between any given version between 3.7 and 3.6, there's probably not any changes on the particular page you're on, but there might be. There might be a difference in the evergreen the way Evergreen works in 3.7 compared to 3.6 for any given feature. So moving forward, using this layout, users can change the version of the documentation to match the version they're interested in um, on any given page they're on. Um, so 3.6 is the oldest one that we have in this view, and then followed by 3.7 and then then latest. So 3.7 is the latest, but technically there's even newer stuff from 3.7 after 3.7 gets um, cut. And latest is synonymous with the word master. Well, you probably hear the word master being thrown around a lot. So in this case, um, we're looking at the absolute last fragment of documentation that was contributed to the code. And that's the latest. There are two places to find the version change. One place is in the bottom left where we've been showing. And there's also another place in the top right. You can click that drop down and then flip versions from there as well. Now, uh, one last feature that we should touch on is the search feature, which is probably going to be used the most. When you're looking at the navigation, you just see a ton of text, tons and tons of stuff. And how do you find anything? Well, you search for it, obviously. So if you're looking for hold, you could type in hold over there in the search, for example. And you'll get uh, instant results of any, of any page that has the word hold in it. Now, one caveat here is that the search phrases are reduced to just the headings. Uh, by and large, the search results only hit on the headings, which is good and bad. You don't want to get a whole lot of results of where the word hold might have been in the wrong context inside of a paragraph or something like that. These are all of the headings that contain the word hold. And you can see in ghost text on the left-hand column, the page in which it appears, and then you see the heading inside of that page. And then, of course, your word is highlighted hold or holdings or holds. Um, so if you were to click on any of these, it would jump you straight to that page. Yeah, take that one, for example. Um, that one actually isn't even, that one's in working with hold templates. Um, so anyway, that, that's kind of a bird's eye tour of the way we've organized the documentation presentation to the users. Yeah, thanks, Debbie. Yeah, there's that's how that search feature works. It gives you the, the page name and the kind of the ghost text followed by any of the headings that it matches. Um, this, I would say that this documentation that we've got here is still pretty new and kind of rough around the edges. Um, most recently, that search feature has been changed after we introduced version 3.7. Suddenly, we found ourselves with duplicate search results. It was giving a search result for the 3.6 version and a search result for the 3.7 version, both. Um, and that's sort of a shortcoming of this uh, documentation site. So there wasn't a way to signify in the search results which version you were getting hits on. So what we did was we made the search box only search the latest. It's always searching the latest branch and not the previous branch. So if you were to use the search feature and you click on any one of these, it should take you to the latest. You'll notice that it says latest in the top right corner. 
And so if you actually weren't interested in the latest and you wanted to see a previous version of the this whole documentation, you have to first search for it, click the result, and then switch the version back to the version that you're interested in. Now this page is a, is a lucky hit. This one has a ton, a ton going on. You can see this is a good example to show off the table of contents. So at the, at the top of every page, like we were saying, you got your table of contents. And this one has a lot of headings and then subheadings. And are there even, are there any examples of triple, a subheading of a subheading? <laughs> no, there aren't. Okay. It gets a little unwieldy when you start adding triples and quadruples uh, subheadings. It makes the table of contents. Um, oh, well, it's organized. That's the whole point. So if it's a sub idea of a great, of a bigger idea, which is also a sub idea of a bigger idea, Obviously, you'd want to organize your documentation like that. So that is my um, dog and pony show of what we're currently working with in terms of our documentation. So Lynn is going to talk about the next item on our list here. Hey, Lynn, you're, you're muted still. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. The next thing we will talk about is the evergreen documentation needs. There is a page on the wiki. Um, I'll put it in chat. If anybody wants to look at it. And these are things that we know we need to be, that we know that needs to be documented. Um, and there's lots of them. Um, there's an easy task for new contributors. We could actually do one of those here in a second. Um, and there's, I mean, everything from easy tasks all the way down to um, tips and quick starts, undocumented features and changes taken from release notes, because there's lots of those. Um, and also, you just sit there and it tells you which set of release notes they're from. Um, and if you'll notice out beside each one of them, there is a, usually a person. This person is um, it's supposed to be actually looking at these and making sure they are actually edited, added to. Um, if you keep scrolling down after all the release notes, it's different shared. Um, Docs are out there. And there's also the other requested documentation. And these are parts of documentation that has never been documented in Evergreen. Um, and a lot of server administration, things like that, which has never been documented, um, that need to actually go through and be documented. Um, and we're going to take over, take the patrons with negative balances, and we're going to actually document it today. Live, we hope. Um, so that's what is, that is what needs to be documented. Um, just click on one. Um, if you do not have wiki access, which I'm not logged in, let me log into the wiki. Um, you can edit this page and go down and if you don't know how to edit a wiki, we will not. You can choose it, make sure you, you you make sure you make your notes about it. And there's a um, there's actually um, somewhere in here. Um, there's a how to go through and actually make it known that you are actually going to document this one. Um, I can't find it right off the top of my head. All right, so if you're new to documentation and you want more information, go ahead and hit up the, the group because they, we're all out there ready to. Um, now, we are going to look at, we're going to move on, and this is the one that we're going to look at, ADL acronym used but never defined. 
IDL, IDL Ackerman used but never defined. So we'll go to the details. If it has a launchpad bug, the launchpad information is on there. And IDL stands for Interface Definition Language. And it's not defined anywhere within Evergreen. Um, so we're going to add this one to the glossary here in a minute. But before um, we're going to do that, uh, Blake, are you going to show Git? Yeah. <clears throat> um, you can just use your screen, I suppose. We have a couple of spots here. One thing that I think you said was that it wasn't in Evergreen. The I, IDL isn't documented in the documentation right. side. Um, so everywhere where the word IDL is mentioned, if anybody's confused about that, they wouldn't have any documentation to explain what IDL meant um, in our documentation. So the- Because the, the documentation does have a glossary. Yeah. The shortcoming here is that we don't have a line in the glossary that would um, spell out the meaning of IDL. So that is a, a need that we need to put into our docs for the IDL definition in the glossary. Now, <clears throat> I have here on my uh, crib sheet that I'm gonna talk about the, um, the folder structure of the documentation, like actually on your hard drive. So if you had, and we're going to, I think we're going to go over how to get this on your computer. But I think yeah. for now, for now, though, I think we'll just take a look at the folder structure and we'll, we'll loop back to how to get this on your hard drive. Um, can we blow that up a little bit? Yeah, blow that up and let's get the icons bigger. There we go. Maybe a little bigger. <laughs> <laughs> this is, you may not have seen it before, um, these are all of the files that, the, the main file structure for our documentation. Um, we're going to go over how you get this on your computer, like I said, but, but here we are. This is what you would see once you get it on your computer. And there's a folder and you can barely probably make out the word, but it says modules. That is where most of the stuff is. If you double click on that. Inside of modules, you'll see a, a group of folders that basically mimic what you see in the navigation. You've got yourself the acquisitions, the cataloging, the circulation, and each of those contain the documentation for those modules, obviously. Now, within each of those folders, there are two subfolders. There's a folder called pages, and that is actually the pages. The, that's the file. That's where you actually get to the, the nitty gritty. That's where each file is delineated for and usually mirrored from what you see in the navigation. So I don't know if you want to look at circulation on the page real quick, but we should we should find, if you go to the website, you should, under circulation, we should find booking. You see, we'll see where it says booking module. That page right there is generated from this file over here called booking. There's a file called booking right there. And she's opening it on, on Chrome, but it's it's just a text file that contains the words of the page booking module on our documentation. So what, I, uh, what I'm trying to accomplish here in my little segment here is a brief overview of the folder structure. So back to the folder structure, um, we've went over modules and then your actual module. So circulation is the example we're on now. And within that you have pages, a pages folder which contains the pages. And then there's another folder called assets. Assets um, can contain lots of different things, but mostly 90%, probably 95% of the things inside of assets are the images, which is probably one of the hot topics, and we're going to go over that today. Anytime documentation contains a picture of what you're trying to document, you're going to have to put that picture file somewhere else. So the picture file... Um, goes separate separate from the documentation words and then you call out 
the picture file in your documentation. Um, and you do that with um, some basic uh, syntax. Blow that up for us there, Lynn, so we can see that. Whenever you get to the part where you're going to put a picture in, you say you would type out image, colon, colon, and then the, the path to the file. And we're going to go over that in more detail here when we actually document um, something for the first time here on, on camera live. <laughs> It's just how easy it is. We, we, we feel so confident that we're going to be able to do this live for you here today. Um, so anyway, image colon colon. I know that's probably not something you would type in English, but that's how you call out a, a picture file. And when this page is rendered on our site, it will say, you know, one in the staff client, comma, select booking, and then caret capture resources, you can probably find that exact link uh, part in there. Yeah, so there's the mirror. That's what it looks like rendered. See, it says one parentheses in the staff client comma, select booking. And then there's this cool little arrow. That little arrow is actually drawn by having a dash caret in the, in the code there. So somebody did a dash caret, which is Perfectly good syntax, and then it renders that as an actual arrow instead of a dash caret, like it would say, like just like that. And then there's the picture right below it. That's the image that we get. Um, and again, show the code for the image again. Image colon colon, and then the path to it, media slash. And um, back on the file structure we can even show off the file that we're calling out <clears throat> there's a there's a lot of pictures in here in the circulation screenshots cuz uh, i think i'm counting 191 there but anyway there yeah so there's the there's the one right there she's got highlighted that's the picture that's being laid into that page so it's it's not um, it's not magic it's um it's just typing out the word for the file, and then it puts it on the page for us. Um, that is what I had. And now Lynn is going to take over and go through the starting procedure. And I, I can give her a good segue here. If you open up the documentation page, I'd like to show you show off something that I did recently to the documentation, which I added under the introduction. Let me flip to the right version. Right yeah. Under introduction, there's a new nav link called How to Contribute Documentation. And this is new. So if you haven't seen it before, don't feel bad. It's just been added in the last few weeks to this page, to the, our documentation. <clears throat> and this is a, a try, a uh, taking a stab at getting everybody jump started on contributing documentation, lowering the bar as, as, as low as possible to make it as easy as possible to contribute documentation. So we're going to go through this crib sheet here together and um, get started on creating documentation. All right. And I'm going to do this live on my computer. Um, we're going to see how this goes. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is go to GitHub. If you don't already have a GitHub account, please sign up for a GitHub. Um, I already have a GitHub account, so I'm just going to sign into my GitHub account. And voila, there's my GitHub account. Uh, we needed to make that. I'm going to move. I gotta move things around. Give me half a second. Okay. Go back to GitHub. All right. So I've signed in my GitHub account. I have been using this for a while, as you can tell. Um, so that's the first thing you will sign up for your GitHub account. We're not gonna actually go through that. And then you ought to have to fork the Evergreen Code Repository. Um, so the code repository starts with 
here. Evergreen library dash system slash evergreen. This is a copy of the actual live git. It is um, as live as it can get. Um, so you want it to um, fork, the, fork this, and I've already forked it. It's in the top right corner there. Yeah, I have to think about sometimes. I'm going to fork it. And see, I've already forked it, so. And it should be. So, and real quick, forking a repository is copying the whole repository into your own account. So you can change it. Um, and why should you fork it? I just fixed the new, the current version of it um, because I just reforked it. And once you fork it, um, then you have a copy of it in your GitHub account. Now you want to install the GitHub desktop software. Um, if you go back to the GitHub, link to it in the documentation. Yeah, there's a link to it in the documentation. Set up. And you I have a Windows machine, so I would use the Windows 64 download. It only takes usually a couple of seconds for it to download. It did earlier today. I don't want to throw in folder. All right, so there's my download. I have two downloads now, so. And you just launch GitHub. Okay, and at this point, you want to sign in to GitHub again. And it's going to open your GitHub discount. And see, it pulled in my GitHub account. All right. As simple as that. Now you have your GitHub account in the, in the I'm going to totally close some of this stuff out. Why not close it out? Minimize it. Okay. Um, so here is my GitHub. Now I want to clone this repos my repository that I just recreated, the fork I just created. I want to clone it on my desktop now. So I'm going to hit clone repository, repository from the internet. And I want to click on my evergreen. Cloned it, but. Oh um, yeah, I have. I'm going to change something right quick. Yeah, okay. I'll click that. There it goes. All right, so I'm going to create my repository. I'm going to just use Evergreen 2 because I already had an Evergreen. And I'm just going to hit clone. And Uh, OneDrive is fighting you, I think. Um, that's okay. Well, we have a clone. We're going to use yeah. that clone. Yeah, use the one that you have already. And you must live right next to a highway. Yeah, I do. <laughs> um, all right, so since we already have a clone, I'm going to use... I'm going to try. Uh, add existing. You just click on add existing on the lower. Um, there's a button for it on the main page there. Oh. Yeah. And then just pick out the one. There you go. 
There it goes. Ah, there we go. <laughs> the toys of... Um, for, for those of you out there that haven't done this before, you won't have any of those screens. You'll just choose clone and it'll... Yeah, just choose clone. It should actually clone it. It should move these repositories somewhere else so it wouldn't find them. And you see, it's actually refre refreshing the repository, as you can see over here. It's getting all the latest, greatest information from the um, GitHub and updating all the files from all the changes that have happened since the last time I cloned it. Um, stopping the OneDrive, stopping the OneDrive app might help for the presentation because it's soaking up all the bandwidth and your microphone is crackling. The OneDrive um, icon in a system tray can be right clicked and then exit temporarily. Oh. Maybe not. Don't worry about it. All right. Quit that. Close long drive. Bottom option. I'll just pause it. Well, I can't close it because of IoT. They don't like it. <laughs> I think OneDrive has messed you up. Maybe make a fresh clone and clone it outside of your documents folder. Clone it somewhere else. Alright, we're gonna go. the um, URL or choose it from github.com. This is the wrong thing. This is yeah, no. brand new. I realized that after. Go to File, go to file and then clone. Yep, yep. And then choose github.com upper left corner of that screen. Oh. Yeah. And then choose that and then change the directory to what you were doing to your users. Yeah, and just make a folder in there. Yeah, yeah, do that. That'll uh, access something. That's weird. <laughs> I can do it. Yeah, because I'm going to stop sharing. He's going to do it on his screen while I figure out what's going on with Mac. Yeah. Let's see here. I can pull up GitHub. And this is what it looks like after it's been uh, cloned. Can everybody see? Yeah. It's, it's pretty tiny, at least on my screen. Yeah. It's small. Very, very small. Oh, my resolution. Oh. My screen resolution. Um, well, anyway, what we were trying to get to were, was following these um, 
Uh, so, Blake, while you're doing that, I'm having a little bit of trouble with the audio, so I just wanted to ask the uh, audience if anyone else is having um, disruption in their audio. Okay. So, Blake, I don't know. You may want to move your microphone closer to you because it was okay earlier, um, or we could try muting whoever isn't talking. Okay. Any better? I have bandwidth problems here. Yeah, bandwidth, that's what I was thinking. Is it choppy? Yes. Kind of yeah, I figured out what's going on, why I couldn't clone it. I forgot I had signed into the VPN this morning, so therefore I'm connected to the VPN into work, and therefore they're blocking it right now. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. You can still edit the docs and take a look at them here together. And I didn't think about that earlier, about disconnecting the VPN. <laughs> Love them out. Don't you love them? Can you hear me? Yeah, you're much better now. Okay, cool. So, if you want to move forward, um, did you had an idea of what you were going to document? So yes, you, and you already have the Evergreen repository on your hard right. drive. You you were just showing it, so I'd say just go from there. All right, so. We'll go back here because this is, yeah. All right, so you go to the, the what is we're going to go into the modules. Do you want to share and, your screen, Lynn? Oh, sorry, yeah. Yes, yeah, I now. Yeah, there, there we go. So we're going to go into our modules. And the glossary is actually in this shared module because there is a shared module. You go into pages underneath there. No, it's not. Tricks is to finding it is to use the site and look at the URL for the site. Let me find out where I had it. I've lost it. So we want to look for the glossary. Oh. And if, 
Yeah, you see the URL there. It's slash appendix. It's appendix slash glossary. So yeah. So let's go back here. And go to appendixes under pages. And there's a classroom. And this is the problem with having one job. Okay. So we're gonna, I'm going to actually open this up with Visual Studio Code because that's what I prefer. And this is the glossary. It's a lot of text on this page. So we're gonna go down here to the eyes. And what we actually, actually I got, I have to work over here. Um, and she said, this is one of the programs that you could use is Visual Studio Code to um, write your, your ASCII dot files. And in Visual Studio Code, you actually have a preview of what it looks like. So I just will click on, I uh, go back and find out what I was going to document. Okay. Is the, the yeah. IDL on the needs? Yeah, yeah, there we go. There we go. There's my. IDL and interface and copy that. Back to Visual Studio Code. Find my eyes again. Now I need to figure out where it needs to go in here. And it's after ICL, before ILS. So come down here. And I'm actually going to. I'm putting in the, the square brackets for the IDL is a link. So I can link, um, I'm gonna put IDL and in parentheses, oh, do the interface definition language. And because this is a definition, Two colons afterwards defines the definition. And I'm going to go back to the bug. Um, and that is the definition that they had, that someone had wrote out. Um, and I'm actually, so I put my definition in. But they also told us in the uh, bug that the documentation also refers to the IDL as the field, field mapper IDL. So I might actually include that in the definition because that to me, because if I actually go look over here, I don't have field mapper IDL over here. To me, that's something that actually needs to be included in the documentation. So IDL is sometimes referred to as the field mapper IDL. Now, So at this point, I would actually also add, go up here to the F's. If I need get your alphabetization. Um, I would put a C reference here. And it actually be a um, a link. So 
what this does, if you show up over here on the left hand side, and you have Film Mapper IDL, see IDL, if you click on IDL, that should have worked. What did I do wrong? Does it work in um, VS Code just in general? Do uh, the other ones work? Yeah. I mean, and these those, are all. Yeah, the, the alphabet works, takes you to the first entry for the alphabet. The ISL one did. Hold import items works. Cool. Let me see, see my first CIDL, da, 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 that's right. Go down here to IDL, IDL, IDL. It should work. Um, I'm not sure oh. if it's. I'm not sure if it's absolutely clear. Uh, something to... else is uh, screwed up in it. Hold on. It is working because you see, this is the reason why it's always good to have your um, a visual representation of it. You see, it actually is popping into popping into the right location, but something is wrong. Does it, need, does it need another return carriage? Yeah. Oh. That's what it needed. Yeah, the term has to be on one line, the definition has to be on another one. Does that bet you didn't want if I could look at them? Now to see how they're different two different definitions. It was all defining it under ICL. Yeah, so the word the term has to be on one line, the definition has to be on another line. So now if we go up here to field mapper, you see CIDL and it pops into the right location. So we have this, we can save this. Now there was a, a part of this routine where you'd make a branch, but on your computer, we just realized that GitHub desktop doesn't work. Yeah. Because of the way. Yeah, because uh, technically what you would start with, um, I'm not actually. Let's see. Where did I go? Oh, yeah, I see what it's doing. So it's it's trying it's, to update it from yeah, yeah, this is all on your OneDrive cloud and it's having yeah. to mirror the files back down. This is not normal. Um, whenever you clone the Evergreen repository to your computer and you're not using OneDrive, <laughs> it won't it won't do all this stuff trying to sync it twice. It would just download it from GitHub onto your hard drive. Yeah. Um, Which it did the first time we did this. Yeah, Lynn just had her computer formatted, so <laughs> Um, you would should be able to if this wasn't refreshing the repository 15z and 752 times uh, you actually would go to branch and create a new branch before you make any changes um, but it's not giving me the new branch right right uh, I think I can probably show it um, yeah I, I've got it over here and I've and my my problem earlier was the VPN too so I think it should be better now. <laughs> Let's see. Oh Let's Lord, see. we forget we signed into them things. Yeah, yeah. Oh, whoa. All right. So GitHub, 
And I'll show up my GitHub account too. Oh. Yeah. Say what? You were multiple screens. Oh yeah, right. All right, so let's get into mine here. Oh no, device verification. Don't worry, I've got it. Somewhere in here. One of my email addresses. <laughs> it sent it to, oh yeah, Mobius Consortium. All right, there we go. Okay. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go to the C docs dot evergreen. Go to refer to the documentation on the matter, of course. And it is called um, da, 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 da. here it is. I'm going to fork, fork that. Oh, I've already forked it. Oh, good. Okay. Now, GitHub, we can show off again a new version. Let's see here. Oh boy. Don't you guys love logins and stuff? What's your problem? This is a good, good um, lesson. Of all the issues you can have. I know, it's freaking logins. This is my, this is definitely my login. Got it right here. Maybe it's because it's out of date. Jeez, should have. Debbie is saying dot org. I don't. Uh, yeah. Hmm. I don't think that's it. Oh well. Anyway, this is this is a repository here where you would you would choose your branch and you can make a branch can fork a branch, make a new branch. This is what we were trying to show off. Right, Lynn? Yeah. So in the GitHub desktop software, which is being cantankerous today, um, you want to make a branch for your new change. And the reason being is you want to you want to kind of compartmentalize your change. And we, we just made the change over on Lynn's computer. The example was was uh, changing the glossary document. Um, and she just changed it right there on her computer, on the file on her computer, just out there in the GitHub um, folder, and, and which happens to be in OneDrive, which if it ever does get done syncing, we should switch back so we can continue that. But you would make a branch, you would make a branch in GitHub here, and you do that by selecting the make branch icon, um, and you give it the branch a name, you would name it, you know, um, editing glossary IDL or something similar to what you're actually doing. Oh, I have it up on my computer if you want me to okay. hijack your presentation. <laughs> oh, Go good. right ahead. We, we are desperately wanting to show this, this step off. <laughs> uh... Yeah, Daniel, good question. So we probably should have mentioned that some of you might have seen the Evergreen repository living in that URL there, git.evergreenils.org. And in fact, that is the authority place. That is the central place where all of the Evergreen code lives. But 
the Evergreen community has created a copy of that and a mirror of that on GitHub, mostly for exactly this reason, to make it easier for folks to, to see it and edit it. You follow me on that? So, oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Katie. This is exactly what we're talking about. So you've, you've cloned it, and let's pretend you're going to make, and this is actually even better because this is an example of what you guys will be doing on your computer. So right by default, just real quick, and this is in the documentation, but I'm going to point out that in the top left corner of this screen right here, it indicates what repository you're currently looking at, and it says they're evergreen. And then next to that is another drop-down menu for the branch. If you click that, you're going to get a huge scary list of all of the branches that have ever existed in Evergreen. And some of those, as you can see, are like 13 years old. Um, tons and tons of branches. And you are unfortunately going to be making another branch um, whenever you're making your changes to the to the repository. Now, if you remember right, and this has been a little bit um, disconnected because of these technical difficulties, but if you remember, we made a fork of the evergreen code repository on GitHub. And, and as I said before, and I want to reiterate because I'm trying to loop back to what we we're talking about, a fork is a copy of the evergreen repository, but in your own account. So you have control over your own copy of Evergreen. So you can do things like make branches and stuff. There's a whole security layer here where, where you cannot do that sort of thing directly to the Evergreen repository, but you can do whatever you want to on your own copy of it. So that's why you make a fork. You make a fork of it, which is your own personal copy. And then you're gonna make your own personal branch on your own personal copy. And that is what I hope we're doing here. So we're going to click on new branch is what the routine would be for making changes. And you would do this before you make your changes. So we skipped over that and we went straight to edit in the documentation uh, because of the technical difficulties. But, but before you edit your documentation, when you do this, when you do this tomorrow, when you're going to contribute and fix all of the problems that we have in the documentation to tomorrow on your computer, you will go through those steps there, fork the thing, and it's, by the way, this is all written out in the documentation site there that we pointed out to you with screenshots and everything to help you get to this place. You would create a, a branch for what it is you're doing. And in this case, we might as well um, call it Katie... Um, uh, glossary IDL, something like that. Now, branches. A little, a little note on branches. The, you're not allowed to have spaces in them. They usually are going to have underscores. So, kind of, you, and you can do what you did. You you can just jam all the words together and use up, you know, use casing to kind of delineate the two words. But uh, an underscore is perfectly uh, allowed. Uh, and so is a hyphen. You can use hyphens to connect words together. And now that you've got your branch named something that makes sense for what you're doing, you're going to click on create branch. And I and do want to base that on master. Ma yeah, yes. that's correct. That's absolutely correct. And this that, is and actually really helpful because I haven't done this since last fall. So it's like, oh, I remember this now. Yeah, yeah. And and the reason why we we mentioned this tool, this GitHub desktop tool, is, is because it's less confusing than using the GitHub website, which you could also do, but we're going to we're going to teach you how to use the GitHub desktop software. <laughs> and I hope that the technical difficulties thus far hasn't shied you away from using it. It should work a lot better on the, your computer. <laughs> So anyway, um, so now now what you've done here is you've you've taken a snapshot of the code as it stands today, and you have branched off. You have um, frozen in time, so to speak. Oh yeah, Lynn's putting that in there. And so, yeah, th thank you, Katie. And so this is the Evergreen code repository as it stands today. 
And you have to kind of imagine that whatever you do to this folder right now, let's let's actually do something real quick. Put a put, right click in the white space just for an example, and just do a new um, text document, and you can just press enter. Okay. Now that we just created a new file in here, and if you switch back to the um, GitHub, look look at there, GitHub Desktop has found that you've made a change. All we did was we we created a, a new file. It's an empty file called newtextdocument.txt. And if you switch back, go ahead and switch back and show it show it one more time. New text document was a file that you created directly in the Evergreen directory, right? And this is the reason why we think this is easier to use. The software, the GitHub desktop software that's running in the background is monitoring that folder, that whole folder. And so any, anything you do in this entire folder, change a file, add a file, add a picture file, any of those things will immediately be reflected in this changes thing on the other side. So you can delete that file now. Go ahead and delete it. And now if you switch back, you'll see that it goes away. So it's it's no longer anything that's different, you know. So this this directory is pristine and unchanged since you've created your branch. Now, if you want to, yeah, uh, Lynn actually gave you the the stuff. So if you want to, you could go ahead and do what Lynn just did on her screen on your screen, Katie, if you don't mind. Yeah. And it was, uh, if you remember, it was under modules, appendix, and then glossary. And you can edit glossary, yeah, pages, glossary. You can edit that with. It looks like you're using. I have uh, I have Vim on here, uh, yeah. which which I like because it's got the um, kind of the the markup colors. But people like a variety of of text editors. Yeah, um, I I recommend, and in the documentation I mentioned this. There are I think three that we call out, but for editing ASCII doc in particular. ASCII doc FX, which I'm sure Lynn is, is smiling because that was one of the reasons she, she got a hold of a, 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 a funny version of it or something and it installed a virus. I don't know, but um, so ASCII doc FX. I use ASCII doc, yeah, yeah. So uh, go ahead and, and Google ASCII doc FX. Um, and let's see what we get. And there's a link. Actually, there's a link to it on the documentation page. Um, and that's the link I used. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> OK. Yes, ASCII.FX.com. And this editor shows you the preview on the right-hand side. It shows you the, um, the documentation code on the left-hand side. And it gives you a file browser so you can change files and so on. So this this editor is not too bad. It it doesn't have the live the live preview. Um, Yours doesn't. No. But the ASCII doc FX does. And that's make make sure that's clear. So I, I would say, and and Lynn actually said it earlier, having that live preview is pretty handy. Oh uh, yeah. See, that's <laughs> More, what I went and got ahead. That popped yeah. up first, and don't. I think. Don't I think I got. It. I got this too, and uh, it's just because it's an unsigned program. Well, it's a Java program or something. Let me rephrase that. The IoT department of the state of Indiana didn't like it, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I okay. am. I am not a state employee. I'm a five hundred one c three employee. So. Okay. Uh, okay. I. Cool. I don't care. Yeah. Cool. So this little program um, gives you the preview, and it gives you the code highlighting. It generates the table of contacts. And one thing that it does that none of the other ones seem to do is it also puts the pictures in the preview. Nice. So it, it, yeah, it gives you a rudimentary um, preview of what the documentation page that you're editing would look like. So now you just have to open the file with that, or yeah, op uh, yeah. You chose not to put it on the start menu. Can't. Oh it. yeah, I did. It, it might be an an option if you right click on the um, 
Yeah, I did. I associated it with the file types. So let's see. Choose another app. There we go. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Now, one thing I will say: ASCIIDoc FX is a bit slow to open. So if you take my advice and use ASCII doc FX, yeah, 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 yeah. It will it will open slowly. This is up to you on that. Okay, there you go. All right. So since oh, okay. since you opened the glossary ASCII doc file, it it browsed your tree view on the left hand side to the pages directory right inside of the appendix folder module. But you can press the up arrow button to navigate upwards. See the up arrow button just above that, all that. Yeah. Now you're in modules, and you can see all the different modules. And you could go and browse a different one if you wanted to. Yeah. Now, um, pointing out here, the glossary page doesn't have any images on it to, that I know of. No. But this, what we're seeing here on Katie's screen, thank you so very much, um, is the ASCII doc FX rendering interpretation of our glossary. Now, if you open up the actual glossary on the final page on Firefox, for example, or Chrome or whatever. Oh, there you go. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes. So I want to go. I just wanted to show the audience the page as it's rendered in our documentation. Yeah, docs. Yep, yep. And then uh, yeah. you got it. And glossary at the bottom. There. So this. So this... it's got the the links here for the. Right. What I wanted to make clear was see the difference in font. Like Evergreen Glossary is in black, and it's not exactly the same exact way it looks in ASCII Doc FX. If you go back to ASCII Doc FX, look at the rendering of it over there. See, it's like it's not exactly the same. It's just trying to do its best. Is is the point I'm trying to make. It just it gives you a rudimentary idea of what it's what it's going to look like on the final page. Does that make sense? Hopefully, Anyways. it does to me. So uh, okay, okay, uh, and uh, a little kind of a little um, side note on asking FX. If you scroll on the right hand side like you're doing there, Katie, and you click on any area, it should jump the code to that area on the left. Did you see that happen? It it jumped, but then it didn't like highlight some text or something. It's <laughs> it's, it's jumping. Jump oh, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I have that same kind of problem where you click on one side. It, it should be scrolling to the spot on both sides, but they can be out of sync. So if you click on brick on the left or barcode, it should take you to that spot. Now, as you scroll down and you click somewhere else, go and click your your new edition. Uh, yep. Yeah. Hmm. Well, you might have to go find it. But oh, anyway. uh, and I haven't. I mean, I haven't saved it yet either, so it could be. But we can go this way. Yeah. Okay. So there, there she's added the blurb about IDL. And I, I can see it OK on my screen. It says IDL in parenthetical. It says interface definition language. And then beneath it indented are the words um, and not bolded words, regular font words. It says a model that Evergreen software component uses to understand how Evergreen's data are structured. IDL is sometimes referred to as the field map, mapper IDL. And then there was another little uh, snippet of, of um, documentation that Lynn put in chat that says field mapper IDL, C IDL. Oh, okay. And that would go down in the Fs. Yeah. Hi, I know the alphabet. 
Yeah, you're going to have to uh, A, B, C, D, E. I always have to sing the song to, to remember what letter. Yeah. Don't feel bad. I just had to sing it. We'll sing it to my niece the other day, and I kept forgetting letters. Wow. <laughs> I was like, ah. It's uh, like yeah. right at the beginning of the Fs. Yeah, so it takes over as the first F entry, yeah. I think. Uh -huh. It does. And looky there, the Ask Is Doc FX. Uh huh. And you can click it, and it should take you. Well, maybe not. It does. She, yep. Oh, it does. Okay. It was just delayed. Well, there. So there you go, everyone. We we just edited the glossary. We just did it. We totally did it. And and now if you save, which is uh, Control S, you should be able to save this. And now you can minimize this ASCII Doc FX and go back to GitHub um, Desktop, and it should see that you've made a change. Look at that. That's what I'm talking about. So, a uh, real quick, and th this is in the documentation. Um, the GitHub Desktop will spell out all of the files there on the left hand side of all the files that you've edited. And then if you click on one of the files, in this case, there's only one file, but if you click at it so it's highlighted blue like it is there on the left-hand side, highlighted blue, on the right-hand side, it will show you, it'll jump down to the areas of the file that you've made changes. So when it says, there you pass by an area that I wanted to show. Oh, sorry. Um, this, is, this is a very good thing to review before you commit your changes because you might have made an unintentional change and you didn't realize it. So I did something weird there, okay? Yeah, GitHub Desktop is telling you that you've made a change here that was probably unintended. And this is a really great example. So go back. I didn't get a good look at what it was talking about. Sorry. What was it? So here it says the line, it's even highlighting. It, 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 there used to be a space there or something? No, the word consortial got in between got inserted into resources. Let's take a look. Uh, so it did. Uh -huh. So now if you save that, oh, Jessica thinks that the F needs to be linked, needs to be moved. Oh, right. Uh, and yeah, across the top. Okay. Yeah, across the top. No, not where... across the top. Where no, you no. inserted the fill mapper IDL definition? Yeah, yeah. What what I what I was going to point out was that listing of links across the top is linking oh, yeah. linking literally to the letter F between a bracket, and so the letter F between a bracket is on which one? None of them. The F F F I F O. Oh, it was on F I F O, but she's mm -hmm. already, she's already fixed it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, good catch, Jessica. That's absolutely right. So then when I save this, yeah. then it's going to... It should have detected that that change is no longer a change up there, and it's not, right? Right. Yeah, it... it but then... Oh, okay. I was looking for this, that it has now... Okay, so I'm going to break it down a little bit. So the line there that is in kind of pink with a minus sign, that is the line that was. That's the way it used to be, right? And what, what's happening here is we're deleting that line and we're replacing it with the following two lines. We're replacing it with the field mapper entry and then the following line after that is the FIFO entry. Make sense? And that, that's GitHub Desktop's method of, of displaying the differences. Um, so pink is pink is out, green is in, and then scroll on down a little more. You've added another line for IDL right there. And that's it. Those are your two changes that you're making to this file, right? Mm -hmm. So if we're satisfied with this change, if there's no other changes, this should address the... Um, Launchpad tape. This should address that this documentation need. And so what you want to do here is for the people who put the code back into the Evergreen repository, do them a favor and give them a little more detail over there on your Git mess message right there, right there on the screen where it says update. Yeah, yeah. If you don't type anything there, GitHub Desktop will just say um, update glossary.adoc. 
This is the boat that we were working on. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Because my GitHub still isn't synced all the way. Uh, two. Consortium music. Yeah. Now, uh, I want to, while you're typing that, Katie, I want to tell the crowd here um, that you're typing this in the description, um, but there's also a title. So with every change to a Git repository, you're going to supply a title, which is what people would see as kind of like the subject line in the email. They just see that. And then the body of the message is down here in the description. Um, if this makes it all the way into Evergreen proper, that stuff will be retained forever. It'll be in the list of things that are changed in the repository. So all the stuff that you put down there will also be saved into the repository history. And yeah. a couple of things with documentation, always make sure uh, your Launchpad bug starts with doc or docs. Um, that way we know it's a documentation. Um, well, it's a documentation um, Yeah. Commit. So there it right. Uh and oh I can assign it to myself. Okay. Wow. Wow, now we're getting really advanced here. Very <laughs> fancy. <laughs> And if there is a launch, but always make sure your doc commits start with the word docs and your um, if there is a launch pack bug, we you actually have the launch pack number in the in there so they know um, what the yeah. commit is for. Yeah. And in, in the the word they in this context is the, are the evergreen core committers. Yeah. The people who review your changes and then put them put it actually into the repository. Uh, the more, of a, right. yeah, yeah. So that looks that looks really good to me. That looks really good. So yeah, you you can commit that, and you'll notice that the button that says commit it says commit to, and then it has the name of your branch. See that? So you're gonna commit that to your branch, and you can publish this. Is we skipped over the part on this, Katie? Is this a fork? Yeah. Uh, yes. This is cool. my this is my fork. Oh, perfect. So you can publish that. Go ahead and do that step. Publish. And what that does is that syncs your change up to GitHub. But here again, we're only syncing the change to your GitHub, to your copy of the repository, not the actual Evergreen official repository. This is your copy, and that's why GitHub Desktop gives you one more step, which is the create pull request step. And if you press that button, it will open up GitHub and ask you to log in as you. Oh. Maybe. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, uh. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, and so uh, you'll see here that all of that same stuff you just typed will just appear here, and then you're all set. Um, it does say on the left-hand side, the base repository is master, and your repository is glossary IDL branch. So you're you're all set. You can create a pull request, and then boom, you just um, you just did it. You just contributed to the evergreen documentation. Give a round of applause. <laughs> Uh, and just for my own, I am sure that um, they're going to cover this in the session on Launchpad. Uh, but I want to go ahead and just drop it in here. Right. Perfect. And, that's and make another. sure you, you also, if you can include the link to the um, to the documentation. Yeah. To the in, 
to the oh yes yes so there there should be a link you can grab out of github somewhere yep. yeah there it is now i think to remember is now don't use that branch for anything else exactly yeah so that's a really good piece of advice lynn you could you could move on and get real excited and start contributing what you like yay and now let's do some more as soon as you start writing changing that directory and you forget to change your branch you will you will suddenly be appending to your glossary idl branch on the on the github desktop and which will mirror on github and all of that so you what you want to do is before and this is where it's easy to make a mistake you have to think ahead of time ahead of time you need to make your branch First, before you change anything, you make your new branch, knowing ahead of time what your branch is going to contain. So your your new branch in this case will be, you know, I think we were going to show off patron negative balances. Yeah. So you could create a new branch called um, patron or dot, you know, docs, docs underscore patron negative balances. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you create that branch, and then we hey we can do that one. So th this one, so step one was the glossary uh, show for you all. Editing the glossary was was fairly straightforward because it was editing a single a document that already existed, and there were no pictures involved. So it was just editing the text, um, and you and you already had the glossary to work from, so you could see all of the other glossary terms and things, and how that document. And all you needed to do was was just copy and paste exactly the syntax that you saw there. Here, we're going to create a brand new piece of documentation that does not exist at all, a new file, and um, at least one image. Uh, oh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you so very much, Katie. <laughs> you are <laughs> Uh, it's good. It's good. This is the best way to learn it is to do it. So yeah, if everybody yeah. here would just schedule a time to do this with Lynn and Blake. Yeah. Then you'll be good to go. Yeah. Well, I was going to say this is actually even better because we get real world. This is this is a real world user using a real world computer, uh, you know, just a Windows computer. And it's that easy. Um, once this is on your hard drive, you can make changes all day using the GitHub desktop to facilitate um, syncing to the cloud and whatnot. So here we go. So if you're ready, we can. Oh, yes. I, th I think actually on my crib sheet, I was going to take uh, this opportunity um, to we have what 30 minutes left. Um, Any questions right quick? You, you have some questions? No, I just oh. want to know if anybody else had questions. All right. OK, sure. Any questions? I don't see any. I've been running through the docs. Through the um, chat and I've not um, yeah there was a question about extensions um, the ex extensions Allison Pearson had as about extensions I actually have a couple of extensions or um, in my um, ASCII code um, that actually do the live preview with ASCII doc um that i have been using um do you want to know what they are um, um so there's a disconnect between what's being shown on the screen here and what lynn is saying lynn is talking about an extension for vs code right and VS oh, yeah. Co yeah, v yeah, VS Code is an editor like like ASCII Doc FX. You can edit your you can edit the stuff and anything that you're comfortable with, absolutely. And VS Code is a very popular um, option. Although the ASCII Doc preview that's on the right hand side, which I think is so crucial when you're editing documentation, that preview does not work in VS Code unless you install extra software called extensions on VS Code, and um, and Lynn, the question was to you because you used VS Code with that extension. Um, I can only imagine you would go into the extensions interface on VS Code right. and search and search for ASCII doc, and you'd probably yeah. find it. And there's like three or four of them. Um, they all have different. My VS Code has like Ang Angular extensions, ASCII doc extension, HTML extension. There's actually the GitHub extension to ASCII doc. Um, 
to VS yeah. Code. Yeah. There's we a GitHub con- extension to get GitHub. Yeah. GitHub yeah. extension for I'll get it straight here in a minute. So yeah, I mean you just go into the extensions and, and you can add whatever um extension you want, software extensions. Um that and then there's several that will do um preview. Um I want to say that we don't, we don't want to confuse you for this presentation, but <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you know, yeah. Now the next question Jessica had was here: If you're comfortable with using Git Bash command line Git, um, you can absolutely use that. Absolutely, yeah. That that would be instead of the GitHub desktop software. And you know, myself, I tend to use both. I like the I like the UI that the GitHub desktop gives you with the layout of all the files that are changes that you can quickly click through them and see the differences. I find that to be superior to the command line for uh, for speed speed reasons. Um, okay, so uh, what I wanted to show was Git kind of a basic idea of Git and branching using a visual aid. So I could show a visual aid for those folks out there, the concepts of how what Git is, what's happening in Git. Does that make sense? Um, let me do a real quick uh, thing. I won't take too much time here. I'll, I'll take the screen. If it works. If I don't go fuzzy, <laughs> let's see what happens. Uh, Chrome, Chrome, Chrome. There we go. Can you see me? Yeah. All right. So I'm going to draw a line here. This is, this is evergreen. Is this going to work? Yeah. Everybody see that? That's the evergreen uh, repository. Okay. And it's, it's going, um, it's going this direction. See that? And then let's say today we made the glossary IDL uh, branch. So suddenly, right at this exact point, we went downwards like this. And now we have ourselves our own branch called glossary IDL, right? And we continue to edit the edit the code this direction, right? And meanwhile, while you're working, in theory, months could go by. Lots and lots of time could go by. And that amount of time, of course, you don't expect everybody to wait for you. You know what I mean? Nobody's going to wait for you to get done with whatever you're doing. They're just going to keep on hacking on the evergreen code up here, you see? So Evergreen just keeps right on a going, and more people are contributing to the, you know to the code and to the documentation. And just like what you saw there in that GitHub desktop differences, those things are being differenced all the time and being, being looped back into the code. And you're down here on a copy of it from this point in time. Let me draw a circle on that uh, from right here. You you have a copy. I <laughs> put a whole thing over. You have a copy of the code from that exact moment in time, and so everything down here on glossary IDL for the uh, number of months or weeks that you're you're editing it, you have the state of the code at that moment, and you don't get any of the changes that occur up here on this upper line. And then later on, whenever you're ready to go and you do what we saw Katie do and you publish your results, you publish your changes, you tell everybody in the community that your stuff is ready to go, somebody um, somebody will come in and look at this line down here, look at what you've done down here. And if everything looks hunky-dory, they'll push it back up into the main line like that. You follow me? Now, this is usually absolutely fine and clean and no problem. The only trouble is, is when something that you changed was also changed by someone else in this interim, in this time up here. So that's called a merge conflict. And, and that's all, that all gets resolved by the, 
by the um, uh, core committers. So we only made a tiny little change to one little file out in the corner of the documentation that, you know, isn't getting edited. And so, you know, your change will probably get merged right back into Evergreen Master. And then your change will then be the in the code for Evergreen Master and move, moving forward. And then this route, this process would, would go on and on again, over and over again. Um, it's also possible to branch off of branches, and it's basically all the same concepts. It's just branches of branches of branches. <laughs> but there's always the core branch, the main branch called master. And that's all I wanted to say. Now, um, my computer finished doing everything it was supposed to be doing. So oh, okay. Do you want to try your try the patron negative analysis? <laughs> So yeah, so we're gonna open the branch in the Visual in Visual Studio Code because it's just what I use. Uh, well, let me share it. <laughs> All right. So here's my branch, and here is here's the branch, and here are my um folders. So I'm gonna go docs, and I'm gonna actually show what we're actually gonna be documented. Oh, come on, log in. Is this screen, the patrons with negative balances. And it's easy that you go to local administration. Patrons with negative balances. And it's this screen. And I'm gonna actually just, we have a patron with a negative balance in here. We had to create one earlier. So this is the screen that we're documented. It's just a simple page that exists that you can go in and find all your patrons with negative balances so you can fix them all. Um, I used to do this regularly before we got adjust to zero to work and several other things where like in 1.9 and two early point 2.0s and stuff where you had lots of patrons with negative balances because of Things got voided out weird, system got, the system got weird or something, and you would have hundreds upon hundreds of patrons with negative balances. And a lot were like 10 to 20 cent fines that got that went negative. So I would come in here every so often and just fix them all. Because um, we weren't going to refund that money. <laughs> um, so I just go in here and fix them. But it would give me a list of patrons with negative balances. So this is what we're going to document. Um, go back to my Visual Studio code. Now, because we know where this is, um, I know I need to go into modules, um, local administration. That's where I would put it, under pages. And there's only the introduction page right now. Okay, there's no other pages because a lot of, if you go to where this dab that a doc, and this is a very important page because we'll edit this here in a minute. Nav.a dot goes in and shows you what that navigation on the left hand side is. Um, so if I go over here into the documentation, if I go into local administration, that na that nav.a dot is what this shows is what pulls in for here. So if you want to add documentation, you've got to add it into the navigation, especially if you're creating new documentation. So, oh, wrong, wrong one. Um, so I know I need to add that to here, but what am I going to add? I need to add my page first. Um, so I'm going to go back to pages and I'm going to open a new file for there. Um, I'm just going to name it negative balances dot a doc. We always had to include the dot a doc, uh, especially Visual Studio Code, so the, so the code mm -hmm. knows what language you're want to add. The there is a syntax, a um, a standard for the capitalization, the casing, the letter casing. Yeah. So everything, all the files are lower case. Like you, you could spell out negative underscore balances, and that would probably be close to what what all the other ones would be called. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I instinctively capitalize things. Sure. That's just me. All right. So actually, I um, wrote it out earlier. So I'm gonna, just going to copy this. And I'm going to put it in the, my repository. Now, if you notice, I've, on this particular version of, I don't have the um, preview. Preview on. Um, I'm going to go. It's probably worth mentioning some of the syntax in here. Yeah, I'm going to get to that in a minute. All okay. right. So here's my, actually, here's the text that I added. And here's the preview. Um, and there are, I have in the past, and I know there's, right. And this is some of the syntax you can do. This is a big old file that I've created. Um, where it's basically, it's, like, there's something wrong. Um, oh, well, I'll fix that later. Um, I think there needs to be return carriage after the TOC colon. Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. Yeah, it needed that space in there. I think I took it out accidentally earlier. All right, so this is a basic, and it, I mean, the, some of the basic stuff is you have an asterisk and it makes it bold. The underline is italics. You can do bold in italics, nude colored text. Oh, this is nice as a nice blue. Um, you can do block text. Um, and a line breaks. If you just want a simple line break, add a plus sign at the end of the text. Um, or else you have to put a do use paragraph breaks to break up your text. So if you've got a little sh bunch of little short sentences, plus sign at the end of the text because that breaks it, sends it automatically to the next line. Um, you can also do source source code. It's some basic HTML, and this is what the HTML will look like. And it'll, all this will format as the the formatting within ASCII doc. Um, your action sequences. This is a, a, a particular piece that is um, the way we do action sequences within um, the Evergreen documentation. It's word, arrow, word, arrow, word, arrow, word, arrow. And it shows up just like this, um, dash greater than. Um, that little arrow translates through the CSS and everything behind the ASCII doc to that arrow. As we said, images or include alt, always include alt text in there if you can. I've seen more and more images that I just want to go back through and include alt text images in. Um, you text. can also. Alt, alt text are for the visual impaired that, or, or if you mouse over an image that's broken, it'll at least tell you in English what that image represented. Right. And don't just use the file name. I, here's an image that's actually broke. Cute creature. See? And actually, this is going to actually. Oh, uh, have me open up and it's going to link to a hedgehog, cute little hedgehog. Oh, ain't it cute? Um, so there are lots that you could also do. You use your bulleted text, ordered list. Um, and this is what I was talking about with the glossary and glossary terms. Um, the term, then the two colons, and then the definition has to be on the, on the second line. Uh, or else it doesn't read it as a glossary. Apparently I have a... Um, there. Um, this right here, this more info right here is a anchor. Because um, you have all the way up top. And it says this is some, a simple Axie doc. Here's some link to more information. If you click on that link, it comes down to that anchor point in the document, the same way as we were having that anchor point um, in the glossary available. Um, 
And these are two really good websites. Um, this is the official ASCII.doc website here. There's a lot to get information here. And PowerMan actually does a cheat sheet. Um, I think me and PowerMan, if we ever met, we would be, would we really like each other because he's a hedgehog enthusiast, enthusiast too. But yeah, there's like all sorts of ordered lists. It's all in the, um, Ordered lists have to have that dot in front of it. Um, and you don't actually have to include that one slash the parentheses. It'll actually make a nice ordered list. Um, and a bulleted list always makes a nice bulleted list. And you have your indentions and everything like that. Um, there are several ways to format these other than what I have here. Um, but these are some of the basics. Um, but yeah, the action sequences always have to be um, in bold. And as you can tell, this is one reason I, li I like X ASCII doc. I mean, whatever program this is, Visual Studio Code, um, because it does, because I have added it, those extensions, the ASCII doc live preview and ASCII doc reach language support. It allows me to actually see this code in the different ways and it does do the whatever the way I have it coded in this style also. And it allows me to do the preview. Um, but going back to the code that we're committing, um, there's also a couple of ways that see, so as you notice that I have my patrons with negative balance and I have my two eagle marks on both sides. That says this is the that let that um, title zero. Um, and you see how I'm accessing patrons with negative balance is it's level one. Um, and you see how the blow bold and you see how and that's really the only thing I can't come up with anything else to put in the title table of contents. Um, but you can see as I go through here, like click right here, I have it as bold, but then I have patron barcode as underline, as italics, because that's what I wanted you to click on. Um, this was short and sweet. Um, and I added a note, this is only branches can be selected. Um, systems and consortiums cannot be selected when you actually do the patrons with negative balances, because that's actually very pertinent because you start there and you think, oh, I'll just get everybody in the consortium or everybody in the system. You can't, you have to go branch by branch by branch. Um, and then I have a screenshot in here. Um, so the, I'm gonna actually use, find out where I'm at. There's my users with negative balance. One thing I do suggest with screenshots is adjust your actual screen to the smallest that you want it to be. Because uh, I wanted to do this complete screen screen here. Um, I'm just going to open up my screen snip. And I'm just using the screen snip that's basically built in with um, Windows 10. As y'all can tell, it's all gone dark. And I'm just going to copy that particular section and voila, I have a screen snip. Now I can open it up and it's going to open it up in the snip and snitch software. And I can adjust my images. I can crop it if I want to crop it more. Um, I can also show a ruler. Um, and then I can save it as whatever I want to save it as. So, and because this is on my computer drive, I can actually go right into here, go into my docs, go into my module, go on my and assets directory. So I'm gonna create a new folder and call it assets. This is going to be unusual. You should, assets should be pre-created for most of these. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're going to need images. Assets, images. 
And that's as far as I'm on. I'm going to actually go back here. I just had to make sure I got. And I'm creating a new folder here. Because we didn't actually have anything that had. So I'm going to open up the images. I'm just going to name it the same thing as because this is my only screenshot. So, so now I've got that saved. Now I'll make sure this actually says naked. And that and actually I'm not. Because I didn't have, I didn't save it into a media, because I saved this image directly in, and now you see I have it right here. I have my assets, images, negative balance. It helps if I can spell. My negative balance is image, and then I make sure, oh, that's a JPEG. Um, I have the same thing in my, but because I have, I just store this directly into the images folder and not the media. I do not have to include the media folder. If you're, if you save an image directly into the image file, or if you create a folder in that image file for the, if you're going to do multiple images, you can create a folder in the images file as the, like, as, as the name of the, page that you're editing and include all your images in that particular folder. Um, but that's the only image I have for this screen. So at this point, because I've made all my changes and they should all save automatically because that's one thing I like about ASCII doc. Um, I'm just going to hit save all so it saves them all. And you see how I just saved the screenshot is my uh, text here because that what seeing these just, just shows up as screenshot um, and you can edit that and say screenshot you can have that as long as you want as a description in your alt headings. So I'm going to save that again. So I have them all. Now if I go over to my GitHub and you see how I have my two files. And because this is a new file, you see I, it has no negative, it's only positives in the same. And if you see the negative balances, there's my screenshot. Um, I would have actually normally just edit this a little more, and which I will go back to. I will actually change. And now I'm going to add my summary. And I said, basically what I want to add to my docs, so this is a brand new doc, uh, set of docs. And now I'm going to commit mine. At this point, it's the same as we were doing earlier. Ah, I do need to add one more thing. I need to go to my nav. I forgot about this. Because we didn't include a navigation to this. I have just committed that to just my branch. That's it. So nothing's gone further up than that. And now I want to include this in my because um, the actual page is patrons with native bot. So this is where it would go in the nav. Um, 
and this is in local Okay, so I have made that change to this particular file so it would show up in the navigation. So I'm going to save that. Now, if I go back to my GitHub, you show how it adds that particular one. Um, this is a something, this is a new concept where you're committing another commit on top of a previous commit but yeah. it's a good it's a good example because you can do that you can do that any number of times because you are committing to your branch and you're stacking changes on top of each other but it's all happening in one branch and you can make as many changes as you want to your branch before you finally publish it or finally tell everybody about it and your entire branch all of the commits are what's going to be added to the evergreen uh, master branch. All right, so I've made that and now I'm gonna commit that to my branch stocks underscore negative balances. But you have to make sure you add that navig na navigation piece because otherwise the doc's not gonna see it. Um, it'll be there. I will say that it can, it's searchable. The search feature will search that document. It just won't be navigatable. <laughs> it won't be in the <laughs> nav. Yeah. We want uh, things in the nav. All right. So now since I've actually committed all my changes to my branch, now I can publish my branch. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. That's, that's okay we are we already showed that off but, the, but yeah the idea there would be to publish it out to github and then do a get a uh, pull request yeah and then after that it, I'll, I'll get it published in a little bit and then you can do the get pull request and because this is something new i would have to add an actual launchpad bug to the system and um and put the information in launchpad so the um Committers can commit this. Um, the core committers can commit the, this documentation to the documentation. So we are getting close to time. Yeah. Go, oh, Katie. Uh, I was just going to say, does anybody uh, have any questions? Feel free to put them in the chat. I do want to thank our sponsors one more time, um, the Consortium of Ohio Libraries for bringing us the pre-conferences today, which have been really fun and I have learned a ton, as well as the Evergreen Community Development Initiative for sponsoring this hop-in platform, and Mobius uh, for bringing us the sponsorship for our captioning today, which has been really useful as well. Yeah. Go Mobius. And Yay! Go ahead. This may be but. <laughs> oh, here we but go. But what, Daniel? <laughs> Thank you, Debbie. For making yes. it making it to the end. Yeah. Thank y'all, the twenty one of y'all who stayed to the end. Yeah. Waiting on uh, there is else. one other documentation. Uh, Jane Sandberg is doing a actual presentation during the conference on documentation. So um, please And that is tomorrow at one o'clock. It's called Building Our Collage. Uh -huh. And she will be covering, I think, more like the soup to nuts approach of the docs. And so if people are wanting a little bit more background, 
uh, that that could be really good. And if you want to go and then kind of follow along and practice what you learned today, you can can do that too. Yes. Uh, this video will be available to review. And um, I wanted to say the syntax stuff that we started to get to there at the end with the dashes and or the equal signs. There's a syntax reference at the bottom of that documentation page on the documentation site. Yeah. So if you actually go back to, I don't have it up, there it goes. Here, let me go to the latest. If you go into how to contribute documentation. Yeah, there's a thing that says helpful links. ASCII.resources. Yeah. There's a quick syntax reference guide yeah. and the dig style guide. Yeah. I refer to that quick syntax guide quite frequently whenever I'm editing the docs. I actually haven't. And the one I always refer back to is, let's get rid of my email, is Fireman's Cheat Sheet. Um, and Debbie mentioned as well, the Hackfest is on Friday. It is 100% free. So definitely sign up, even though if like me, you will not be there the whole day because you have to catch up on other things from being here. Um, uh, definitely sign up and take the opportunity. It's a great opportunity to, to try things out because people will be around to answer any questions. Like if you get stuck anywhere, you can just hop on video and chat with people about it. Um, ev everything that I was showing that, that my setup and stuff I had done at the, at the hack fest in fall of 2020. So that is a great way to kind of get started in practice and hopefully, hopefully then you'll be able to continue on your own. I'll be around that morning. Um, Eastern time between now 9 a.m. and 2 p.m. Um, but then after 2 p.m., I will not be available. I have other plans. And uh, as for oh, Daniel's, Daniel actually finally finished the question. Um, how do you manage your docs locally? Um, it depends. There's organizations, we actually, everything in the Anna for our local docs uses Google Drive. Um, we are looking at standing up our own Antor server and migrating everything to Antor. As that's going to be some work, but that's one of the things that we're looking at. Um, I know uh, other organizations that use a um, a form of an online doc. Well, so it was the old version of the way we did the documentation, um, doc, which are ASCII doc. Doc, um, doc book. Doc book, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I think Sitka uses ASCII doc. Everybody has, and then the question is a little more uh, general here. How do you manage your local docs? But then he also said, do you clone the Evergreen docs? So are you're talking about local documentation about Evergreen? Is it specifically how to use Evergreen? I mean, hopefully the Evergreen documentation can stand on its own as a manual for using Evergreen. Yes, it could change the ASCII doc. Um, but if you're talking about specific documentation that's not real, doesn't really, it's not appropriate to have it in the Evergreen documentation, your own separate wiki that's a manual for our members. Yeah, yeah, there's a certain amount of documentation that each, you know, especially as you get bigger and bigger in consortium, you have to become uh, a little more organized. You'll, have, you'll generate your own docs. And a lot of people use wikis and we at Mobius, we use ASCII doc with, with Antora. Because I, I, we really like that presentation with, with the different versions and breadcrumb and a lot of things you get for free. But yeah, Google Drive and PDFs. Yeah, everybody's kind of doing their own thing on, on that. Yeah, what I've seen a lot of is wikis, um, Google Drives and PDFs. Um, we use Google Docs itself um, because we have multiple upon multiple people in our consortium editing those docs. So um, that's yeah. the way we use, that's why we use Google Drive. Yeah. Um, 
I'd like it to. just, I mean, whatever you're comfortable with, with your local doctors, what we suggest. Um, One thing I'm hoping that can happen is since um, the Evergreen documentation is in the Evergreen repository, it could be pos theoretically possible that each org unit could override documentation in the Evergreen documentation and have your own lo local version of the community documentation inside of the Evergreen staff client is, is what we're maybe going to walk towards maybe someday. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you know, that's, like, that's uh, an ultimate goal of the documentation interest group is, is to get the documentation in the actual product. <laughs> yeah. Right. So now that it's, now that it's all been published on the web and can be easily accessible on the web and different versions can be easily accessible on the web, you could, it's just one step farther to put the help button in the corner of every single interface in the staff client. And that help button could theoretically pop out, go straight to the documentation on that interface that you're on. And then you could take it another step further and allow individual systems and branches to override the documentation down the tree. So if you didn't like or needed to change whatever was the community documentation for your consortium, and then furthermore, just like everything else in Evergreen, you can override down the org unit tree. Yeah, that's what we would love to happen. So come on Friday, you can help yeah. make it happen. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Come on Friday and we'll do it. We'll do it. We'll do it all. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Hopefully by then my computer will cooperate. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. We're definitely over time now. So thank you everybody for being here and we will see you tomorrow for our officially opening of the keynotes of the conference and our keynote speaker. Have a great evening. You too. Bye. Thanks, thanks everybody.